physical science time, we're going to talk today about the elements. Because I want to, I think we're going to start this by talking about the classic elements. We did talk about this before, but what were the elements of um, ancient Greece, of classic antiquity? Uh, earth, fire, earth water. fire, water, air. wind, air. The alchemists, wait, let me start a little bit um, earlier. So those are the, I said four, I, said, I was told doing this the whole time, but it's four. There are four classic elements, what we sometimes call the Aristotelian elements, named after Aristotle, a Greek philosopher. It worked really fairly well for quite a long time to think about nature in that way. Once again, they were fire, earth, water, and air. Even early, like, soft sciences, like, there's, there was no such thing as psychology, but to the extent there was psychology at all, they would ascribe a person's personality traits to one of those elements. For instance, someone who is kind of uh, loud and flamboyant and uh, very happy all the time, they would say that person is, like, fire. They would say that, that that person has a sanguine, which means blood-like temperament. They are also associated the ancient elements, the earth, water, fire, and air, with the human body uh, goo. Goo. They, the, the goos that a person had in their body at the ancient Greeks were blood, that one's pretty self-explanatory, uh, phlegm, which you've probably heard of phlegm, cholera, which is what they call, which is another name for a disease, but uh, what they called yellow bile. When a person would throw up, they'd be like, that's a different fluid from blood and phlegm, so they'd call that yellow bile. And then there was black bile, which was something that they found in corpses after they had died. And so all those different things, melancholic, melan you've heard of melancholy, Melancholic, that means black bile. A person was melancholic if they had too much black bile. A person would get sad if they had too much black bile. A person who was phlegmatic would be like, like kind of lazy and not doing much. They had too much phlegm. A person with too much blood would be on fire all the time. They'd be like, they'd be yelling at folks like I'm yelling at you. Got too much dang blood. I gotta have a nosebleed one of these times. I probably will. Anyway, they they had these this way of thinking about the Earth with these four classic elements expanded to all the realms of different science. Eventually, later on, um, they would also put into there something called quintessence, which was the fifth element. Quince, you might recognize as the root word for five, which was the, what they thought was the element through which all the heavenly orbs, the sun and the moon and all the planets floated. Kind of cool. Um, and then they would also, the alchemists later added these things. Salt, mercury, and, oh dang, I can't remember the other one. Salt, mercury, and sulfur were the other three elements. So, the, but to the alchemist, remember, like, uh, what was his name? Yannick Brand. You remember him from the video? Um, the alchemist who discovered phosphorus by distilling urine. You remember that? For to him, there would have been eight elements: earth, air, water, fire, quintessence, or the ether, which is what the planets move through, and then sulfur, salt, and mercury. All of that's wrong, except for sulfur and mercury. So let's get into what the actual elements are today. The elements as we know, and we've talked about this before, are organized into the periodic table of the elements. Check it out. That's pretty good, actually, if I do say so myself. We're going to spend some time. I want you to draw this little diagram in your book. This one's a little bit too fat. Let's slim them down a little. Um, we're going to spend some time. It's a little too tall, too. Fat and tall. OK. Um, we're going to spend some time labeling this, so I'm going to draw a pretty accurate representation. Yours is a lot better than mine, is lovely. Um, I want you to have a fairly accurate representation of this in your notes. We need to have two columns of approximate equal fats in the first column. Then we're going to leave this kind of as a block, and then we're going to have, can you guess how many columns over here? Incorrect. Well, how many should we have all together? We should have all together how many what we call represented elements. We'll get to that in a second. But there should be eight all together. So we've got two here. We need to have six. So one, how many lines should I draw? If I want to divide something into six, how many lines? Perfect, Kelly. Thank you. Two, three, four, five. And it's a little bit on the ugly side now, but we still love it. Who isn't? Who isn't? Who isn't at least a little on the ugly side? Things are getting too melancholic in here. We need to, we need to blood it up. Same line. A, a, a reasonable, a normal person with a healthy balance of their humors would have all four of them in perfect balance, right? If you had too much blood, what do you think they'd do? They'd kill you. Be in a game? No, no, no. no. Back then, what would they do if you had too much blood? Slit your wrist. Well, what would they have more? Come on, that's not very professional. I have a more professional way of doing Blood yeah. They'd give you some leeches and they'd suck out your blood. If you had too much phlegm, what should you do if you had too much phlegm, do you reckon? 
Just talk a dang loop, blow your nose or whatever, right? If you have too much, if you have too much yellow bile, if you make it beautiful, barf it out. If you have too much black bile, I don't know, I guess. Well, you're dead. Just die. Just die. I know, I don't. That's kind of what I was talking about there is a little bit of a facile definition of all of those things, but it's kind of interesting to think about. Let's label these babies. Okay. First thing we should draw is that all of these, all of these, hey, by, by the way, what do we call, what do we call the, um, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you a question and now I've plum forgotten what it was. Anyway, I'm just gonna draw this down here while I think about what my question might have been. The vertical column. That's exactly right, Mitchell. You just want to call it <laughs> No, what do we call the vertical columns on periodical things? What? Uh, what did you say? You said families, and that's correct, and someone else said groups, groups which is correct. What do we call the horizontal rows on periodic table? Periods. Periods. And do you still have to know those, do you reckon? Yes. Yes. That was vocab from chapter 17, but you still have to know those. If you don't know those, go back to chapter 17 and look it up. We have names for many of these specific families on the periodic table, the specific columns. Some of them we don't, and some of them we group together. Um, for instance, we're going to start with, you'll find on many periodic tables, there's this kind of deal. What's this orange thing I just drew? Stairs. It goes straight down. Stair, step, line. That's not a very creative name, but that's what I've always heard it called. And this separates effectively the what from the what? Whoops. Non. Metals over here from the metals over here. I'm drawing all this in orange because this is going to be the first way I divide it. You you should find a different methodology for labeling unless you have colors. But the non-metals are on this side of the stair step line. The metals are on this side. What's the difference between those two things? What are the properties of metals? Are solid solid room temperature except for mercury. Malleable, not brittle. Hard. Hard usually. Yep. They conduct heat and electricity. Um, that's that's sufficient. And then if we were to say, if we were to define the non-metals in the absence of those things, we'd probably say that they are either gases or liquids at room temperature, or they're brittle solids at room temperature, right? They have low melting points, they don't conduct heat electricity, that kind of stuff. We usually actually do define as a group the non-metals by how they're different from metals. Okay, so we have the metals and the non-metals. Another, by the way, how many valence electrons have I got in this in this group? And how do you know? One. I've got one valence electron in this group. Why? That's the first group. Yeah. So let's think about real simply hydrogen. How many total protons does hydrogen have? It's atomic number one, so it has how many protons? One. One proton. If it has one proton and it's neutral, how many electrons must it have? One. One electron. If it has one electron in its energy level, how many valence electrons does it have? One. Good. These, these all have two, the ones in group two have two, for instance, beryllium. Beryllium, how many total protons? Four. Four. How many total electrons in the neutral atom of beryllium? Two. Four. And if it has to have two in the first level because of two in squared, how many must it have in its second level? Two. Two. So it has, <laughs> has two valence electrons. Group 13 has three, group 14 has four. Group 15 has 5, group 16 has 6, group 17 has 7, and group 18 has 8. Sometimes I say things like, how many are they happy with, or how many do they want to have? Atoms can't be happy, atoms don't want anything, they have no emotions or thoughts or feelings at all. But how many are they most stable with? All of them, 8. They're all most stable with 8, except for 2. Which two are not stable with 8? Which ones are not stable with eight? And why? Radioactive. No, nuclear stability is a different thing from chemical stability. How many electrons are in the first energy level? Two. Two. You can only have two. Two in squared. So two times one squared is two. So which two elements are not happy with eight and instead are happy with two? Helium. And hydrogen. Hydrogen and helium. Hydrogen and helium only need two to be full, because the first energy level only has two. Does that kind of make sense? Other than hydrogen and helium, they're all most stable when they have eight valence electrons. 
in general, how do they, what do they do in order to be more stable? They exchange or share or somehow combine, which we call that process a what? Do you know? Yeah, chemical bond. They form chemical bonds. We'll get to that. That's actually all that, what we just said is chapter 20. But for now, we know how many advanced electrons these things have. And, and check it out. Each column, because it has the same number of valence electrons, all of these have one valence electron. They have what? What else is true of them? They have similar properties. Because, we'll write this down, valence electrons, oh, eh, ah, I had a spelling trouble. Valence electrons determine chemical properties. What, what could you guess are the chemical properties of those elements, do stop doing that, of those elements that have eight valence electrons? They're noble gases because it might be called noble gases. They don't need to do what? They don't need to change. Yeah, they don't need to react. They don't need to combine because they already have eight valence electrons, right? In fact, since we mentioned that, let's just start that in. We're going to start naming these groups now. Those elements that have eight valence electrons, except for helium, which has two, are called, I'm not going to do it in yellow because no one will ever be able to read what it says. These with eight valence electrons, I'm going to do black on my chart is going to be the name of these groups. You have to know, the whole point of this chapter is to know the names of these groups, okay? You need to know, in general, which we kind of glanced over, the properties of metals. You need to know, in general, the properties of nonmetals. You need to know the names of the groups. Those are the three things that are the big ideas from this chapter, okay? These are called the uh, noble, gases. Gases. noble gases. Noble meaning what? Stop talking, please. What? Yeah, noble meaning not really smart, but what? Strong. In this case, it does mean stable. It means like if, if a person, um, this is referring to like the uh, medieval or early modern uh, aristocracy in places like England and France, the nobles were those who didn't associate with the little peasants. I'm a noble gas. I don't have to talk to no freaking molybdenum, right? You know what I mean? Like the rest of these guys, peasants, they got to react, they got to do business. The nobles are just like, see ya. I'm better than you. They don't need to react. They already have what they need. They're, they're rich in electrons in the same way the nobles in early modern England would have been rich in dollars. Would have been rich in pounds strong. They didn't use dollars. Come on. Working back, the name of group 7 or group 17 are called the halogens. Because so group 18. Group 18 are the noble, noble gases. gases. Okay. They have eight valence electrons, but they are group 18. I, I'm sorry, so I'm going to put in black the actual group number because it is slightly different. Sorry, thank you for pointing that out. Two, one. The halogens. I think of a way that you might have heard this before. Um, halo. Oh, yeah, Halo, the video game. That was a whole different thing. Um, gens, that suffix gens means creates. Um, what these are, these create salt. That's what they're named after. They, they're not the only way that salts can form, but these, the halogens means that these elements create salt. The halogens are, you should write these down, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Why do you say it like that? Iodine and astatine and tennessine. I said it like that because it, it's nice if they all rhyme, right? You'll hear a, a person calling that iodine. You've probably heard it called iodine, have you? I'm going to call it iodine. I'm always going to call it iodine. Chemists call it iodine because that way it rhymes with the other elements in its group, which are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, astatine, and tennessine. I say that one with a little accent. So why are those other four gray? I don't know what you mean by why are those other four gray. Uh, one, one's 13, one's 15, one's 17, and... Oh, uh, on this chart that that you're looking at, the gray outline represents that it's a synthetic element, I think. No. Now, no. why are mercury is metals gray? Because it's a liquid. Yeah, because I'm the border is gray. I'm not sure why the border is gray. I don't, oh, I do know now. I'm going to make this up, but I bet it's because that they don't know. See how, like, for instance, see where it says fluorovium 114, heavy metal ductile? I bet those ones, nihonium, Muscovium, Tennessine, and Agonessin, I bet those ones are, are gray because no one knows yet. There hasn't been enough produced for them to know about chemical properties. Anyway, 
the, no, the halogens are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and acetine, and tannicine. Um, the next column over, the next one to the left, we're starting that way, we're going this way. Group 16 are called the chalcogens. Can you guess what these produce? Produce what? Chalk. Chalk. That's exactly right. That's why they're named that. That's not really a good rule. That's not one of the properties they all have, but that's why they're called that. Chalcogens. These include what? What elements are in group 16? I can't see what they are. Oxygen, sulfur, sodium, polonium, and Now check out what's kind of cool about this is if you look up there, what, what kind of element is oxygen? It's a gas. It's also a... It's a non-metal. Okay? Sulfur is a... It's a non-metal, but it's also a solid, right? Selenium, then, is a solid non-metal also. But look at tellurium. We, didn't, we haven't talked about this, but look at tellurium and polonium both touch the stair-step line. So they're really neither left nor right of the stair-step line. We touch, we call those, and I should have mentioned this before, but any element, elements adjacent to the stair-step line are metalloids. I really should have mentioned that earlier, and I apologize, but they're metalloids, which means they have some properties like a metal. What are the properties of a metal again? Hard, hard, solid, hard, not malleable. hard usually solid, malleable, ductile, good conductors of heat and electricity, generally dense, usually shiny, all those things. Some of them, so metalloids can have some of those properties, but they also have properties of a non-metal. Oid means like. Metalloid are like metals. They're not metals, but they're like metals. Opioids are like opium, but they're not opium. Um, androids are like humans, but they're not humans. That's what an android is. Um, but metalloids are those elements that are like metals. They have some properties of metals and some properties of non-metals. So look back to our talkogens. Tellurium and polonium are both metalloids. And then livermorium would be what? Livermorium should be a metal. No one really knows for sure, it's but it's not touching. Yeah, it's not touching the stress of life. So the chalcogens are not a group of all non-metals. The chalcogens have. It is too touch the. No, it's not. Well, I guess it, the, it, no one really knows how the stress line works down that far. It probably actually keeps going right one and then down another. Really, no one knows because, like I said, the chemical properties of those high number elements are really unknown. But anyway. We could think of, and even if not the chalcogens in this next group certainly are, some non-metals, some metalloids, and some metals. And we call those mixed groups. But anyway, the next group is called, the group 15 is called the nictogens. Nictogens. And I cannot ever for the life of me remember what that means, like what the nicto stands for. But they're called the nictogens. The nitrogens include nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, bismuth, and muscovium. Nictogens. How many valence electrons do the nictogens have? Uh, five. They have five valence uh, electrons. Cinco in espanol. Group 14. Also, sometimes the sometimes this is just called the nitrogen group. That's a way easier name. Sometimes these are called the oxygen group. That's a way easier name. In the nictogens. Sometimes 16 is called the oxygen. No one ever calls the halogens the fluorine group. They're always the halogens. I've never heard it called the fluorine group. Same thing with the noble gases. Everyone calls those the noble gases. Group 14, I, I, it has a better name. I think they're called the crystallogens. You don't have to know that. If you want to write it down, you can. But they're usually just called the carbon group. I'm going to write parentheses. They're called the crystallogens. No one really calls them that. It kind of switches. No one ever calls this anything but the noble gases. And then sometimes people call this the oxygen group or the chalcogens. And then down here, they almost always call it the carbon group. Group 13 is called, 14 was the carbon group. 13 is called the boron group, which is sometimes rarely called the icosogens. All of these, these 12 groups here, 12, I think 12, maybe 10, 10, 10, 10 groups here are all called together the transition metals. Transition metals. What's transition mean? 
After changing? Yeah, to change from one thing to another. There are metals that are between the light metals on the left side and the heavy metals on the right side, transition metals. This, this group that's usually expressed down here, I, we talked about this before, but this, this whole, these two columns here actually fit in right here. There's a couple of reasons why we don't usually represent them as actually being in line with those. What's the primary one, do you think? Yeah, it makes the periodic table tuning, tuning fat. We don't want that. It's going to take up too much room on the board. So we usually just separate them out down here. And these things down here are called together either the rare earth metals or the inner transition metals as a group. All of them together, I wrote it on two lines and there are two lines here, but all of them together are either called the rare earth metals or the inner transition metals. And then the top row of them is called the lanthanides. I really got an accent on that one. Lanthanides. And the bottom one is called the actinides. Named after the first element in the group, or the row, which is lanthanol on the top and actinium on the bottom. We're going through this kind of fast, but so far you're with me, right? I mean, we're only like writing one word every like 45 seconds, so I'm talking fast, but you're with me as far as remembering these things. Are you, Roman? Okay, you change your mind. Group two is called the alkaline earth metals. Can you spell it to us? Yeah, A L K A L K A L I N E space earth spelled the normal way, metals spelled the normal way. Alkaline earth metals. Group one are called the alkali metals. The way I was told in physical science to remember this is that how many words are there before metal? In group one, there's one word before metal, alkali metals. In group two, there are two words, alkaline earth metals. That's kind of an easy way to remember it, I think. So why is hydrogen? Oh, and then hydrogen, really, actually, hydrogen is almost always placed here, but it's really, really, really not in the alkali metals. A lot of periodic tables, especially modern ones, not this one, this has kind of become customary, but several periodic tables will place it just all by itself right here in the middle. Um, because it has properties that vary depending on how it has either lost or gained. Remember, the special thing about hydrogen is how many valence electrons does it want? No. Two. Two. It wants two. It has one. It also is actually satisfied if it loses that one. And so it can have a lost electron, which will give it a plus one charge, it can gain electrons to go to minus one charge, or it can even bond covalently. So really, it has multiple different ways it can behave depending on what it's interacting with. So the hydrogen kind of we think of as in a different way from how we think of the others. Another thing we need to talk about, um, there, I was missing something I was thinking about earlier that I was like, oh yeah, well, Dan, we need to talk about that. We will, um, we will sometimes not on video, but we will as a class, if you can be very good, we will, we will look at samples of several of these elements so you can kind of get a feel for what they're like. Um, but I want you in the range of activities? No, not all of them. I said a sample of some of them. I kind of think of what. No, I'm, I know I'm missing something. But one thing I want to talk about for sure before we go on is this idea of a diatomic molecule. Can you guess what this is? What, what might diatomic Atomic is in the name. Yeah, I is two. Two, so two atoms. A molecule, which is a combination of covalently bonded atoms, a molecule made of two atoms. And we call it, we, we use this word to describe those atoms, those elements, that when they exist in nature as a pure substance, bond with each other, or bond with that same element. And so they are hydrogen. There are seven of them. When you find hydrogen in nature, it's always H2. When it's just hydrogen, it's always H2. Two atoms of hydrogen will bond together to form H2, always in nature. Okay? That's why we call it diatomic, because there's two of them. There are seven diatomic molecules. Hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, 
and iodine. And we're going to write their formulas over here. So hydrogen is H2, oxygen is O2, nitrogen is N2, fluorine is F2, chlorine is Cl2, bromine is Br2, and iodine is I2. There are seven diatomic molecules. How many diatomic molecules are there? Seven. You have to have these memorized. Hydrogen, let's, let me point the periodical for you. Hydrogen, and then check it out. Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. What kind of shape is that? An L. That's not how it is. You might even draw your L like that. It's kind of like a seven. You don't draw a seven like that? A little bit you do. Like if I drew this on the board, and I said, that's an L, you'd be like, no, dog, that ain't an L. And if I said this is a 7, you'd be like, well, it's not a very good one, but it is an L. It is a 7. Uh -huh. So, these are the diatomic molecules. These are the molecules that, when they exist in nature, are always found bonded to other atoms of that same element. What is that? Cl? Cl2, yeah. Cl2. And the bottom one is I2. Remember, remember, the way you can kind of tell, the symbols of an element will always be either just one capital letter or a capital then a lowercase. So this must be capital C, lowercase l, and this must be capital I. Um, your book talks about allotropes, which you need to make sure and read. Your book talks about synthetic elements that you need to make sure and read. And your book also talks about the three kinds of bonding. We get more into bonding in the next chapter. The point of the next chapter is bonding. But you should be aware of these. There are three kinds of bonding. Ready? We're going to write them down right now. This will be the last thing we talk about. Are you ready to go? Here we go. We call it ionic bonding. If the elements, if the two atoms that are involved in that bond are a metal and a non-metal. Also, either one of those can be a metal alloy too. Metal alloys kind of slip into cracks here. Ionic bonding is if it's a metal and a non-metal. We call it covalent bonding, and we will talk more, much more in depth about how these bonds form and what goes on. But for now, you just need to know the names and what kind of atoms are involved. Covalent bonding are when non-metals, when it's two or more non-metals that share electrons. It's always about the electrons. And then metallic bonding. Can you guess? Metals. Yeah, metals. So ionic involves a metal and a non-metal. Covalent involves only non-metals. And metallic involves only metals. And really, any of those can have metalloids among them. We can have metallic bonding among metalloids. We can have covalent metal, covalent bonding among metalloids. And we can have ionic bonding among them. So they kind of just fit in anywhere. But the three kinds of bonding are ionic, covalent, and metallic. Do you have questions about any of this? Here's what, let me repeat what you're responsible for learning. You need to know the names of the little individual groups. Right? That's, the, that's the primary goal of this chapter. And also you need to know about their little, their valence electrons, um, and then the metals versus non-metals and where you find them. Basically, this whole chapter is about how do I navigate the periodic table? How do I know where these things are and how do they behave? Do you have questions about any of this? Kimmy, I like your glasses. Uh